Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for yet another study in God's Word. This is T.J. Gifford with the Lake City Church of Christ. So very thankful that you have joined us for yet another study. We teased you last week about starting a study in the book of Jonah. I'm going to change plans slightly because we will not be having regular Sunday morning Bible class for the next two weeks. I thought I would continue the book of Acts study here in this hour. And so this week and next week, we're going to be studying Acts chapter 3 and possibly Acts chapter 4 next week. And so if you were with us on Sunday morning, then you know that we begun to study Acts chapter 3. And at the beginning of Acts chapter 3, we see that Peter and John, I don't believe too far removed from the events of chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, they found themselves entering into the temple. And as they passed through a particular gate, uh, the gate called Beautiful, they noticed a lame man was carried there and laid there and he would daily ask for alms. And the Bible says something unique about this lame man. Not only was he lame and did not have the ability to walk, but he was in this condition from the time he was in his mother's womb. Well, the story continues by saying that Peter and John looked at him. They made eye contact. And, Peter, and when the conversation ensued... The lame man was supposing that he would receive money from Peter, but Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise and walk. And so he grabs him by the hand and he lifts him up. And not only does this man who had never had the physical ability of walking, but he was never able to even learn to walk. Miraculously, though, his ankles and his legs and his bones and joints and ligaments and muscles, they all fastened together and, and mentally he was able to know how to walk. That's amazing in and of itself, as one person in our Bible class pointed out. And he was not only walking, but he was leaping and running and praising God. And as he was running around the temple, making a scene, we would imagine, people looked and they knew that this was the man whom they carried every day at the gate of the temple to beg for money. And yet, from this opportunity, Peter took to preach the gospel. And so in Acts chapter 3, verses 10 through the end of the chapter, what we see, or rather verses 11 or so through the end of the chapter, what we see is Peter preaching his second sermon as recorded in the book of Acts. And so I don't want to be bogged down and look at every little detail. But what I will say is that, number one, Peter was opportunistic. I want, to sh I want to look at five lessons in particular we can learn about the preaching of Peter. Number one, he was opportunistic. I believe, though I cannot say for certain, that Peter and John was entering the temple that day to go and look for somebody to teach the gospel to. They were entering the temple, the most busy part of town. They were entering the temple at the hour of prayer, 3 p.m., where the most religious-minded people would be gathered. And I, before they even entered the gate, behold, they saw an opportunity. They knew that God could work wonders. They had seen it before. And they knew that lame men could walk again. They had seen it in the ministry of Christ. And so seeing this as an opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, Peter goes over there and through faith in God heals the man. And this creates a stir. It creates a scene. It creates a crowd. And now you have the attention of a whole lot of religious-minded people. It's a perfect opportunity to preach the gospel. And so number one, Peter was opportunistic, verses 10, 11, 12, and 13. Number two, as Peter begins to preach, he doesn't preach about himself. He doesn't preach about the good work he had just done. He preaches in such a way that he makes it about Christ. Go with me in your Bibles again to Acts chapter 3. And I want to begin reading in verse number 11. The Bible says, Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's. They were greatly amazed. Verse number 12, So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people by saying, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this, or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? He says, 
The glory belongs to God in verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, He has glorified Jesus Christ. He has glorified His servant Jesus, underline it, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now, we'll talk about the last statement in that verse in just a moment, but I want you to notice that he brings the attention immediately to Jesus Christ. He was not there to win fame or popularity or be known as a miracle worker. He was not there to earn money himself by the wonders he performed. He was there to point souls to Jesus Christ. And that's a sober reminder for us today that whatever we do, whatever good work we do personally or congregationally, whatever thing we do, it ought to, one, bring glory unto God, and it also must direct people to Jesus Christ. I want you to notice in verse number 13, he says that this Jesus Christ was glorified by God. He was glorified by your God, as is what he's saying directly to these Jews. The God that you believe in, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers as a Jewish nation, that God has glorified Jesus. Now that stands, and we'll talk about this in a moment, in direct, in direct contrast to how you as a Jewish people treated Jesus of Nazareth. He's going to point that out later. He would go on to say in verse number 13, he would reference, in verses 13 and 14, he would reference that Christ was holy and he was the just one from God and that he was the prince of life. He's not talking about himself. He's elevating Jesus in this message. If you go down to verse number 14, I believe it is, he then tells them that this Jesus was murdered. And verse number 15, that God raised this Jesus from the dead. And so, point number one, Peter was opportunistic. May we be opportunistic and look for opportunities to preach the gospel to someone. Point number two, he made it all about Christ Jesus. And so must we in all that we do. Now, just to go ahead and read verse number 14, the Bible says, in verse number 14, but you determined, but you denied, underline it, the Holy One and the Just One, and asked for a murderer to be granted unto you. Verse number 15, and you killed the Prince of Life. If you go down a little further, he talks about in verse number 15, whom God raised from the dead. And so this entire message, this entire address is about Jesus Christ. And so what is Peter doing in his sermon? Number one, he's teaching us to be opportunistic. Number two, he's making it all about Christ and so must we. But number three, and this is somewhat unpopular for preachers and, and those of us who share the gospel today, it's, so, it's very unpopular to point this out, but like it or not, Peter convicts the listeners of their sin. Again, if you notice verse number 14, he says this, but in, even in verse number 13, he says this Jesus who is the Holy One of God and the Just One of God and the One who's been glorified by the God of our fathers, he says that you delivered Him up, that is to be killed, and you denied Him in the presence of Pilate, even when Pilate wanted to release Him, and you killed and murdered the Prince of Life, verses 14 and 15. He's convicting them of their sins. And that's important because the Bible says that we've all been guilty of sin, Romans 3, 23. The Bible tells me that the wages of my sin is death, that my sin separates me from God, Isaiah 59, verse 2. And so sin is real. And I, as a human being, am guilty of sin. And any good preacher worth his weight, he will convict people of their sins, acknowledging that he himself is guilty of sin. Now, why is it important for us to be convicted of our sins? You may remember in the first sermon that Peter preached in the previous chapter, he preached that Jesus Christ came, yet he was denied and murdered, and they had the blood of Jesus upon their hands. And the result was, in them being convicted of their sins, they cried out, verse 37 of Acts 2, and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And, from a res and as a response, Peter gave them the answer and the steps that lead to salvation, repent and be baptized. And so I cannot 
I, I do not understand nor appreciate the atoning blood of Jesus until I first realize I'm lost in my sins. I cannot respond to a message of salvation being rescued from sins unless I'm first convicted of my sins. And the gospel does just that. It pierced the heart of those on the day of Pentecost. As it pricked the heart of those in Acts 7 when Peter preached the gospel. And as it pierces our heart today. Here's what we learn from Peter's preaching in Acts 3, his second gospel sermon. He was opportunistic. He took advantage of the opportunity that was presented unto him. Number two, he made it all about Christ and so must we. Number three, he was not afraid to directly convict the listeners of sin because sin was indeed committed. Number four, he directed them toward faith in Jesus Christ, toward repentance, and toward conversion. If you notice here in the text in verse number 16, he says, In his name, through faith, this is of his name, Jesus Christ, through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness or healthiness in the presence of you all. And so he's getting back to what brought the crowd together, the miracle the lame man whom they had seen every day laid at the gate called Beautiful. He is now walking and running and leaping and praising God. And he says, this man is healed not by our own power, but because he had faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, though it isn't right after this verse, if you were to jump down, uh, what the Bible says in verse number 19 of this passage, he says in verse 19 that you need to repent, therefore... And be converted. Now let's stop there for a moment. Repent means to change our outlook, change our thinking, change the way we think. Conversion is changing who we are and changing how we live. And so what he's saying is that we need to have faith in Jesus Christ, combining what he said to the other audience in chapter 2. We need to repent and we need to be baptized. In this passage, we need to repent and be converted. And so believing and repenting and being baptized all has, the, to, has something to do with us being changed from being a sinner to being a saint. From us going from being lost to being saved. It has something to do with us being a Christian. Notice how he puts it in verse 38 of Acts 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. What's he say? For the remission of sins. For the removal of sins. He doesn't preach a different message at all. Notice in verse 19 here. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Underline it, that your sins may be blotted out. The idea of being blotted out from the original language is that it is smeared away. It is covered up, it is atoned, it is remitted, it is removed, it is taken away. And the only way our sins today can be taken away, can be removed, erased, is if I repent after having believed and I'm baptized and thus I'm converted. That's what these two sermons are telling us. Later on we learn the importance of confession in another chapter here in the book of Acts. And so, here's what we are learning in Peter's sermon. Number one, he was opportunistic. Number two, he made it all about Christ. Number three, he convicted the sinners of their sin. Number four, though, he directs them toward faith, repentance, and true conversion in the name of Jesus Christ. If you look at verses 19, uh, the end of verse 19, 20 and 21, he says a few things about things being purified, or rather things being refreshed, and ultimately, all things will be refreshed when Jesus Christ comes again. Now, I want to take your attention to verses 17 and 18. And here is a fifth and final observation. He, he relied on Scripture to build his case. Peter was opportunistic. He made it all about Christ. He convicted sinners of sin. He directed them to conversion through faith, repentance, baptism that ultimately led to conversion and, and sins being blotted out. But number five, he didn't do all of this just by teaching his own message. No, he threw out this whole sermon in Acts chapter 3 is relying upon the scriptures of the Old Testament. You may notice in verses 18 and 19, or rather 17 and 18, 
he directs them to the Old Testament prophets. He says in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. He's showing a degree of mercy and grace and understanding. You have the blood of Jesus on your hands. You denied him. You betrayed him. You asked that a murderer Barabbas be released. And yet you wanted to kill the holy and just one of God, the prince of life. You're guilty of sin, but I understand that you did it ignorantly. And so for this reason... Uh, and even if it wasn't in ignorance, God's mercy and grace are available. Salvation, conversion is available. He says in verse 18, But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all His prophets. He says all the prophets from the beginning were prophesying about Jesus coming and you denying Him and you rejecting Him and Jesus suffering and dying on the cross. Verse number 18, by, foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled these prophecies in Jesus Christ dying on the cross and suffering uh, before the cross. With all of that being said, he's going to go on and say, if you will look at verse number 22 and following, he says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, and then he quotes Moses, Moses was one of those prophets who predicted that Jesus would come about. Here's what he says, For the Lord your God will raise, up a, will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things. Moses told them to hear Jesus, but many of them did not. He would go on to say, hear, Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you, verse 23, And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from the people. He's giving them the consequences of, of their actions. And you can notice verse number 24 also. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel to those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. As Jewish people, they would have known the prophets. They would have known the scriptures. And to convince them of this message that Jesus is the Savior and they're guilty of rejecting Him and thus they need to believe in Him, place their faith in Him and repent and be baptized and be converted, He's giving them biblical proof. He's not just spouting off. He goes on to say in verse 25, You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Look, you believe in the words and the promises made to Abraham. You believe in the words of Moses. You believe in Samuel and all the prophets that came thereafter. Peter is saying, I'm telling you that all of this is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the lesson for us is that if we seek to share the gospel with anyone, may we rely upon the Word of God, the Gospel, the book we call the Bible, and may it be our standard for all that we teach, all that we believe, and all that we practice. He concludes in verse number 26 by saying this, "You To you first, God, having raised up His servant Jesus, sent Him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. In essence, what he's saying is that Christ came to bless you. And Christ came to take you away from your sins, or rather take your sins away from you. He came to forgive you of your iniquities, but instead of seeing that and appreciating that and taking advantage of that, you rather murdered him and gave him the cross that was only meant for Barabbas. Now, all of that is profound. This is Peter's second sermon. And so what Peter is teaching us in one way or another is to be opportunistic. Look for opportunities to preach the gospel to the lost. He's telling us that whatever we say, whatever our message as a church or individuals is, may it be all about Jesus Christ. May we not be afraid to call sin, sin. And at times... Sinners need to be convicted of sin. He's telling us to direct people to faith in Jesus Christ and repentance and baptism and true conversion, not just being Christians in name only. And lastly, he's showing us that we need to rely upon the precious Word of God, the sacred Scriptures, in all that we do. Maybe this is a longer than average lesson, but let me just say that the second sermon of Peter is so filled with information that was useful to them that led many of them to salvation. 
And certainly the same message can lead souls to salvation in Christ today. May we preach it, and may we preach it just like Peter did. I hope that we will be better as a result of this study, and we ask you to come back and join us next week at the same time as we introduce Acts chapter 4. Thank you so very much for your attention. Take care, and God bless.